How are we doing, everybody? It's Honorado and Company. It's Chris Honorado. It's Ashley Miller, a jam-packed show. Two very special guests on the show. Kate Fagan, best-selling author, Niski Una, former basketball star, mm-hmm. and Magnum P.I. will join us. Jay Hernandez as uh, that great series, the iconic TV series, joins the NBC family this uh, spring, I'll call yeah. it, because it's really the spring TV season. At, Fired up to have both those conversations shared with all of you. And uh, and we have breaking news from the NFL, Ash. So you know what? I'm just going to roll. Let's get right to it. Out of the darkness and into the light. This is Honorado and Company. Sponsored by Alphenhouse. All right, the breaking news here on this Thursday morning as we do the show live on a Thursday. I almost feel like we should give out a prize, like who's the first to check in. It's Sam on this Thursday. Good morning, Sam. It's good to see you. Out of the darkness, into the light. Yeah. Like Aaron Rodgers. Well, yeah, here that's that's exactly what I'm saying. Out of the darkness, I know, I'm just pointing to the light. And oh yeah, okay. Sorry, your Wi-Fi was breaking up on me. Uh, oh. Rogers ends his darkness retreat. Uh, the news broke about 8 a.m. Eastern Thursday. He had booked a four-day, four-night trip trip uh, to Sky Cave Retreats in Oregon. From what I read, it was. Um, a small room with a queen size bed, a yoga mat, uh, a bathroom, and there were lights. It was fully powered. There were lights that you could turn on from the inside if he chose to turn on the lights or not. I don't know. So nobody knows that he actually did a darkness retreat. Knowing him, he did because he's a strange. Oh, he's of course, um, he did. What were they doing? Like sliding your food under the door? Like, what is this? Good question. I don't know. It's the owner of this retreat. <laughs> it, like it, I mean, part of the room is is below ground level. Yeah. Um, and the owner, for whatever it's worth, confirmed that Aaron Rodgers was there and has checked out. So, you know, again, Thursday morning, it's 9, it's, it's 10.03. If you're watching us on TV, maybe we already know what's happening. But at this point... How long will it take, Ash, for Aaron Rodgers to decide what he wants to do? Because this isn't just, yeah, I want to play for the Packers or I want to play for somebody else. This is at 39 years old, of course, with more than $50 million coming his way in almost 60, for that matter. Do I want to play at all? So how long will this take? Uh, I don't think it's going to be quick because I think the impression people got initially was that this darkness retreat was going to be the answer. But I I don't think he's made it pretty clear that I, it's not the goal wasn't come out of darkness and announce where I'm going to play or what I'm going to do. So my guess is it's not going to be quick, um, at least a few weeks, but I, I'm going to say like a couple months, right? A few months. No, Why no. Not? How, what do you think? 72 hours. No way. Maybe a week. Maybe a week. Here's the I'm deal. hammering the over on that. Oh, what? Okay, let's set a number here. Let's set a number. You say a week. You said seventy-two hours, so a week is fair. Okay. You're gonna take the under. I'm taking the over. That's I'll a, take the under. I'll take the under on a week. All day long. I will take the under on a week. And Tom right. Watson Prize. He was first to check in. Dinner's on you. On you. That counts. That counts. Um, look, free agency starts March fifteenth. There is no deadline given. From the Packers to Rodgers, this is when we need to know. But Mark Murphy did say, he's the team president, we would like to know before free agency. Okay, because maybe you just move some things around the quarterback room if if you have to right. trade Rodgers. Yep. I think Aaron wants to do right by the Packers after 18 years, and also what's beneficial for him. The sooner he decides, probably the better for him, I think. All teams are on the table at this point. 
Yep. The longer he waits, maybe the Jets feel pressure to make a decision on a guy yep. like Derek Carr, and all of a sudden the Jets are off the table. Mm -hmm. um, maybe the, the, the Raiders decide we are going to make a move on a guy like Jimmy Garoppolo. Now the Raiders are off the table. For me, Rodgers, I think, knows sooner I make a decision, the better this is going to be for me, the better it's going to be for the Packers, the better I look in terms of kind of helping out this franchise for the future. Uh, I, more, I will take the under a week. More options for him. You're so, like, listen, if you're the first, then you get to make, the, you know, you kind of pick. Once a team is off the table, say Rodgers somehow slides in and goes to the Jets. Well, now the Jets would be off the table for Derek Carr. So the longer you wait, the fewer options you seemingly have. And, and somebody can slide in, whether it's Jimmy G or Derek Carr, and take a job that maybe you wanted. Um so, yeah, I, I mean, you're right. It makes more sense for him to go quickly. I just don't know that it's going to happen all that quickly. J-Man's watching. How about this, though? Apparently he arrived Monday, left Wednesday. So whatever four-day four retreat he had. But maybe he – listen, maybe we find out today. Maybe he maybe he thought, you know what? I had 48 hours in the dark. I know exactly what I he want. He answered his own questions and emerged from the darkness. This is the weirdest conversation that's ever been had about sports before. Can we do can we do this? I mean Thanks to your guy. Do we have a love connection on Owen Co? Is that what is developing no. on it's, Facebook here? I'm not sure that that's no. is it? No. I mean obviously she's completely oh. fake. But it's still funny. It's still very very funny. All right, so I'll take the under on a week. Ash is taking the over. Anybody wants to comment and chime in on that? Uh, how long will it take Aaron Rodgers over. to make a decision? Put uh, it on the record. What do you What do you think he will do ultimately? Demand a trade? Yeah, I think yeah. so too. I think so too. Um, even even with the promise that that team showed late last year as the receivers yep. developed, I think he's kind of like I'm good. Yeah. I, I want to be traded. Now, how much say will he have in that trade? Remember, Favre had no say. Right. He wanted You're to go to Minnesota. Where you go. And he would have taken Chicago. He just he had a vindictive attitude towards yeah. that trade. And the Packers said, we're trading the AFC East. You're going to the Jets. And that was that. I, I don't know that Rodgers will have any more say than, than Favre had, which was zero. But the Jets are, again, funny, you know, very funny thing on the table for for this potential move. If, if yeah. I also just that. think like you're, you're going to need, the Packers are going to need to get what they think is fair for him. A and maybe it's just like, Hey, get rid of his contract. I don't even care what we get back. You got to get something back for him. So they're going to have to get what they think is a fair offer. Otherwise they're not going to make the deal. Yeah. And it'll be three ones. Mm -hmm. It'll be, that'll be Steep price. Not as steep as this. $45 million a season for Daniel Jones. That is what he Absurd. is reportedly Absurd. seeking as he is now with new agency. Um, the franchise tag is still out there. So the window has already opened for NFL teams to use the franchise tag. You have a couple of different franchise tag options. Ultimately, I don't think the Giants end up using either franchise. They might use it and then get a deal done, but I don't think that the tag lasts into the season. They'll get Jones under contract. I, I do believe they'll get Saquon Barkley under contract as well, um, but this is absurd. Now, the tag, as you can see, would pay Jones $32 million. Mm -hmm. He is nowhere – I mean, this is this is ridiculous. I don't know if it's just like leaked – information and no one actually said this i mean i don't know if they're trying to drive the price up a little bit but of course there's no way he's going to get 45 million dollars a season but that's the thing i if i'm the giants i'm like you know what go ahead go test the waters and when you don't come close to 45 come back and talk to us because no one no nfl team is paying that man 45 million dollars a year no. You could put the you could put the non-exclusive franchise tag on him, and what that would do is it would give Jones the right to negotiate with other teams, but then give the Giants the opportunity the to match tag. it. Yeah, the exclusive tag, none of that happens. He's just right. locked in. That's it. But you could, if you really want to, kind of play the game, you you could do that with Daniel Jones. Maybe Saquon Barkley, 
again, here's the tag. If they use the franchise tag on him, it will cost the Giants about $10 million. What we could glean from Barkley's comments in the last season is that he's not looking to break the bank no. on uh, being a free agent. So to me, that says like $8 million a year. Yeah. Maybe he should talk to his boy. Who's his boy? Daniel? Daniel Jones. Yeah, they are boys. And tell him like, listen. I'm not looking to break the bank. What? Why are you trying to break the whole organization? I mean, come on. Because that's what quarterbacks do. That's what quarterbacks do. I'll take I'll take Saquon. All right. Kate Fagan uh, was a huge star at Niskayuna on the basketball court. She then went to Colorado, and she has been uh, a sports media star ever since, working for ESPN and now with Dan Levitard and Meadowlark Media. But she continues to pump out great books. Her fourth book is coming out soon. Uh, it's called Hoop Muses. And we are talking with Kate Fagan next right here on Honorado and Company. Sellers Appliance Center, our commitment is to you. Providing essential appliances that families depend on for cooking, refrigeration, cleaning, and sanitation, plus appliance repair. You can have peace of mind that Marcellus is here for you today and every day, like we have been since 1957. Helping you make the right choice with trusted brands like Whirlpool, Maytag, KitchenAid, and many more. Shop Marcellus Appliance Center in-store, online, or by phone. We're here for you. You've heard of unsung heroes. The men and women of NYSCOBA are the unseen heroes. For the past year, you've learned about our many charitable endeavors. Now it is my privilege to share with you the work performed by our members, the 20,000 state correction and law enforcement officers shielded from view. They work in difficult and dangerous conditions and are an extension of the police who protect our neighborhoods. NYSCOBA honors New York's police and firefighters and salutes its own members who help deliver a peaceful night's sleep. And now back to Honorado and Company, sponsored by Alpenhouse. Back on Honorado and Company, it's Chris and Ash Magnum PI star Jay Hernandez still to come on the show as uh, that show joins NBC. This is going to be like ghosts of Kate Fagan's past. There may have been a moment where she was interviewed so much by News Channel 13. She was like, if I never have to talk to that place again, it would be great. <laughs> it wouldn't be the worst thing in the world. I'm on the air every night with Bob McNamara. Um, so, you know, but here we are now. Kate has her fourth book ready to uh, come out on March 7th called Hoop Muses. And I know I love the illustration. It's I awesome. love the idea behind it. I can't wait to find out really kind of the inspiration behind all of it. Let's bring her on. Kate Fagan, who is, uh, was a basketball star from Niski. I was going to say he's from Niski, but I know there's a backstory to all that, but you were a basketball star at Niski, Kate, and thank you for doing the show. How are you? Yeah, I'm good. Thanks for having me. Of course, a blast from the past news channel 13. I, I have VHSs taped with Bob McNamara's top nice. 10 area players. So here we are. <laughs> Love it. And, and we still do that top 10 area players. So you just don't tape it on VCR anymore. Right. No, and not DVD. We've moved on to digital files and all the rest. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. Um, Kate, before we dive into the book here, I'm hoping you can give me some sage advice. You co-host a podcast with your wife. I co-host a podcast with my wife, Ashley. So when you're in the middle of a conversation, how exactly do you get her to side with you? <laughs> you don't. You just yeah. you just give up. You don't even have those expectations. Um, okay. you, yeah, you, you basically just, yeah, I just kind of turn over the floor as frequently as possible on our <laughs> podcast. Yeah. And you know what I, I try not to do is have the last word in every mm. podcast. Well, I'm a man and I'm not just smart enough to do that. That's the problem. <laughs> it's, it wouldn't but be you, fun yeah. if we agreed all the time. Wouldn't be. That's right. Fun. That's right. All right, Kate, this is, uh, I've, I haven't read all of it, but I've read a lot of it. It's unlike anything that I've ever seen. And I know Megan Rapino was the one who kind of said, there's nothing like it in its, in its existence. Obviously, it looks very different mm -hmm. than like you're not reading the novel. It looks very different. What is the inspiration for this book? Where did it come from and how, how did it start? It was actually almost like a cliche. I was taking a shower and I was think I don't know why I was thinking about basketball. I mean, I think about basketball a lot, but. I had read a book. There's a series of books by Shea Serrano, 
uh, basketball and other things, movies yes. and other things, rap and other things. And I just kind of out of the blue was like, wait, we should do something like that for the women's game. Because I had been over the last couple of years, if you've even casually been following it, you've seen the popularity of the WNBA rise and certain players would be on like GQ sports fashion, um, you know, their Instagram page. And I was like, wait, there's a lot of pop culture and there's a lot of fun flourishes that I, I think people don't quite understand that are associated with the women's game. So it kind of all came together um, you know, not, not instantly. It took a few months to get Simone on board and then mm -hmm. to get Sophia on board, but we wanted to do something really, really different when it came to the women's game. We wanted to make it really fun and poppy and, and joyful. How did the partnership with one of the greatest players uh, ever come to be? Well, I, I, I knew I wanted a player attached because even though I had played at Colorado, I, I stopped playing in 2005. There's been a lot of basketball since then. And I didn't want to, I didn't want to miss out on what an iconic player who played at every level might think who they might think is the best backcourt okay. of all time, or I just needed that insight. And so um, Simone has always been really into pop culture as well. Like if you follow her, she loves sneakers. She loves the fashion game. She loves talking about lots of different things that are, close to basketball, but not about basketball. So she was the perfect partner for it. I mean, so, so the logistics were like, I reached out to her agent. I was like, would you be interested in this? And she was just in the process of retiring. So projects like this were a little more appealing to her than if she had been in the heart of her career. Obviously the illustration is eye catching, but I think it, it also kind of attracts, I think this is a book that can survive like multiple generations. Obviously you can have this a five-year-old can read it and learn something from like the comic. It, it's almost got a comic book feel with the yep. commentary. And then you've got, it's, it's an in-depth research paper and novel on the history of the game. So you can have adults of any age learning so much about this game. What is your hope just overall when someone picks up this book? Is it to learn more about the game, to appreciate it? What was, what's your hope for it? Well, Ashley, you kind of nailed our pitch when we were trying to sell the book, which was basically like you said, an eight-year-old who's just falling in love could love this or, you know, a 90-year-old who maybe didn't get a chance to play the game because Title IX hadn't passed or played it in their backyard, they could also love the book. I think the key, one of the key things that I always say about the book is it's not really meant to be read cover to cover. Mm -hmm. uh, it is meant to kind of sit on your coffee table, to bring you joy when you look at it, to pick it up and you find new little Easter eggs in it all along the way. And that was like a very distinct kind of premeditated way of building the book because we knew we were up against it when you say you're writing an illustrated look at the history of women's basketball. You have to clear the hurdle that a lot of people don't know any of the history of women's basketball. Mm. I mean, they may, they may be able to say UConn, right? They may be able <laughs> to like just utter one name, but we didn't want to be like, okay, and in 1935, because... That's not, people aren't really not gonna care because they didn't, they've never heard about it before. So we wanted to make something that was like, whether you'd heard about it or not, the illustration would catch you, like the way the book pulls you through. We, we knew we had to build that into the book. Can you uh, quantify Kobe Bryant's effect on the women's game or the impact that he, I know this is a book with in parentheses, the women's game, but to me, Kate, he he just he was such a champion of the sport for women, especially um, that I think it it forced just traditional basketball fans who maybe didn't watch the WNBA to really start paying attention. Yeah, and even the aftermath of after Kobe's death, you'll you've seen a lot of his contemporaries pick up that mantle in a way they might not have done before his death, I mean, you, and even explicitly so, you know, like yep. Steph Curry even, um, you know, has developed relationships with certain WNBA players and kind of mentoring them in the, in the way Kobe had been and very explicitly saying like, it's an honor to carry on that um, legacy that, that of, of Kobe and Gianna. And so, I mean, Kobe is in the book for, for numerous reasons, even trying to articulate Chris, what your, what your question was, which is, what was the impact of the way he engaged with the women's game while he was alive? What, what did we miss out on 
Yep. In terms of like what the legacy could have been if he had been around for another, you know, generation or two to continue to help grow the women's game. But, um, you know, the, the book is mainly about like the women of history, but we couldn't, we like there are there are moments where it's like there are just key men who helped launch or helped save or help build. And Kobe was certainly one of the athletes in this last generation who is crucial to the way a lot of fans see women's basketball. And there should just quickly ask, like to me, yeah. Kate, there, there should be like it would be unfortunately more expected than it, it should be. But I, I would be sad if it, if it, if you thought, well, I can't include any men in this book because they just haven't played a vital role. Like that would be a very sad commentary, but but it wouldn't be totally unexpected, unfortunately, for me anyway. Yeah, I mean, I think that part of you know what we talked about when it came to the book is we weren't we weren't trying to like rewrite the history and exclude the, you know the men who were key along the way but it does so happen that the men who were key along the way you already know their names right <laughs> like you brought up kobe you probably know gino you certainly know james naismith like does do they need a book yeah. honoring them yeah. not n not as much as we wanted to pull some of the women from like you know native american women in the early 1900s who played the game women from the 1940s and 50s who you've never heard of who were played for, until they were 50 because they loved it so much. Like these are names you haven't heard. So we wanted to make sure that we gave the majority of the space to introducing some of the history because it's really interesting. Yeah. In the same way that, you know, we've seen movies be made about the interesting moments in men's sports history. We haven't seen that on the women's side, but of course we weren't going to like leave out some of these key faces and, and moments who were, were integral to, to the growth of the game as well. Kate, I'm very involved in the game of lacrosse, uh, indoor lacrosse. And something that I learned early on in your book that kind of shocked me was the role of what I know as residential schools for Native Americans, where children were, were forced into these schools, forced to assimilate. But the role that basketball had in some of their lives and, the, and these basically like traveling teams for a lot of these women that were the Globetrotters before the Globetrotters. Was there anything along the way? I mean, I'm sure there was a ton that you learned, yeah. but anything that that kind of just like shocked you that you didn't know that stands out that was kind of like, wow, this is unbelievable. Yeah, uh, there there was, for somebody who played the game for so long and come from a basketball family, I, you know, I wasn't so confident that I thought, I'm not gonna learn anything in this process, but I was pretty surprised at the just like decades of basketball playing that were lost to history. Like when I started researching the book, you know, you've got Naismith invented in 1892, and then, like, I could have named you, like, Cheryl Miller did some stuff in the 70s, yeah. <laughs> and then Ann Myers. But everywhere I looked, I could connect women to the game, even in pockets of time where you would have said that there's no way people were playing that or women were playing them. But, like, the one specific detail, Ash, that, like, shocked me was the, f the first ever women's intercollegiate game was in 1896 between Cal and Stanford. And it, it, that didn't mean that Cal and Stanford continue playing until today. They, you know, Stanford said a couple years later, the leadership was like, this is unladylike. And so Stanford didn't have a program again until the 70s. Yeah. But at that first game at the Armory in downtown San Francisco, their men were not allowed to watch, but they were climbing the scaffolding outside the building to peer in. The, the papers in San Francisco sent illustrators, same as photographers back then, and writers to cover this game. And this is the key. The profits of that game went to fund Cal's men's track team's <laughs> trip. So we've got this, the original moment and women were funding men's sports. And then of course Sounds they put the right. kibosh on it. Yeah, but nobody talks about that. Like what could have happened if we didn't say women had to stop right. playing in 1896, but it had a chance to grow in mythology and lore and history if there wasn't like a 70 year interruption. So. Everywhere I looked, there were like little details like like that. And it was awesome learning all of those. Yeah. I don't know, Kate. I mean, I'm, I'm this is recency bias here, but um back to Kobe. In, in, no, in the <laughs> exactly. Let's talk about LeBron James. Yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, in the last 20 years, who has been the most pivotal person in the women's sport? I mean. Sue Bird for me is just one that I always think of her longevity and and I think Sue and Diana for me the were social like, presence yeah. yeah yeah 
maybe that's kind of like a northeastern Yukon bias as well. Could I mean, be. Yeah. You know, uh, also growing up in the northeast, I kind of always had my eyes on on Yukon. But I would say, you know, when I talk to uh, for, for a different podcast I do, we bring on a lot of like Aaliyah Boston from South Carolina. Currently, we just interviewed. And when you talk to a lot of those women coming up in the game now, Candace Parker comes mm. up a lot yep. about somebody whose game, because she was like kind of the first in the women's game, you know, she's six, four, but she could shoot the three and she could handle the ball. She's kind of, she kind of brought that element into the women's game. And so you see a lot of young players really looking up to her still to this day. And then, you know, Neko Agumake for reasons, she, you know, for reasons off the court, because she's been the president of the players mm -hmm. association in the WNBA. So she's just been, transformational in terms of like the things we talk about with the WNBA now about like, are they going to get commercial flights? Like they've opened up free agency that has led to something like Brianna Stewart coming to the Liberty. And so there's kind of these players too, who not only are on the court, but behind the scenes have done a lot of like the, the union work that has gotten women's basketball in particular to where it is now. So I would add those two to the mix, but I mean, of course, Diana and Sue from a, from a behind the scenes and a forward facing um, position are, you know, key members of make getting the WNBA from a place of will this league last to this league is on solid ground. Yeah. And for me, it's funny because I didn't even think, I mean, obviously I know they went to UConn, but for me, it was just like the longevity of their careers in the WNBA. Yeah. The fact that like kids 20 years later still know who those two are um, and obviously what they've done off the court. Um, how much does it make you smile to see someone <laughs> like a Brianna Stewart who is, you know, one of the ultimate stars of the WNBA coming out and pushing and being vocal and feeling like she has the power and the ability to make change, because I'm not sure that 10 years ago that was the case, but for players to now come out and push for their rights and to push for equality, that just has to feel good for the women's game. Yes. And I think when you talk like Simone, obviously was on this project, she would talk about how even 10 years ago, if something had come up, that they wanted to be vocal about, whether it was something that had happened in the world or whether it was something that was happening in terms of their own treatment as players, they were all really uh, advised to not make a big deal because there were there were people who were saying, and they were saying it legitimately, you, you don't want to rock the boat because the boat's not steady. And they didn't want to be the generation of players who like was fighting for 10,000 more dollars only to have the league fold because owners were like, well, no, we, we don't. The second you push against us, we're just ripping this rug out from under you. So to see them now, I mean, they know, right? They're, the WNBA is in a position now where it it's not going to fold as a response to players advocating that they shouldn't fly commercial. Um, and so to see them have that power now is really cool. And to see them like Brianna, like trying to figure out creative ways to solve the problems of women's sports and taking a page from the U S women's national team book on the soccer side, you can kind of see all these pieces coming together to where we are now. Selfishly and, and my Northeast bias will show it here. I, I grew up watching teaspoon and Lobo with the, I love that the Liberty now have, you know, the, the big three. I mean, the big three, right? Huge stars in the number one media market is just very, very cool. And 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 obviously we'll hopefully push this thing farther than it's already gone. Uh, what made Maddie run it was a New York Times bestseller all the way to number one. This is Kate Fagan's fourth book. And you see it at the bottom of your screen, Hoop Muses. It comes out March 7th. You can buy it anywhere you buy your books. Um, Kate, you played in the NCAA tournament four times with, oh, by the way, we haven't even talked about your career. Four times at Colorado. I mentioned it a couple of times. Yeah. Who did, you, it in. <laughs> <laughs> who did you beat in your first NCAA tournament game? Mm. Wow. Well, that was, you know. Is this wow. trivia for Kate? Yeah. Do you You're know? You're her on her own career. Yeah. Do you, you know what? I feel like at one point we beat Charleston Southern in like a first round game uh, at home. Do you know the answer to this? Or are you just putting me on the spot without any oh, no. facts to back it up? Um, no, this is this I, this I looked up. Uh, it was in 2001, and you beat the 11th seeded Sienna 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 College. That's wow, right. that's right. I Sienna remember when that 11th matchup. seed in the NCAA tournament. They had a good team, and yeah. I remember when that matchup came out. I was like, "What? How is this?" Because I I grew up playing pickup ball 
I mean, even when I was at Colorado in the summers, I'd be playing pickup at Siena College with those players. So obviously the, the NCAA selection committee didn't know those facts, but yeah. it felt very personal to me. That's you, beat up, you beat up on New York teams. You had a career high at the time uh, when you scored 22 against Syracuse. You had 20 in a game against Buffalo. You just you just beat up on New York teams. Took it personal. Thanks. Yeah, thanks, Chris. I don't my dad. If my dad were here, he would say, "Don't look at how many shots I took to get the twenty-two <laughs> points against Syracuse." I think I took like eighteen three pointers to tr to get that number. So, but yes, we'll leave it at that. Okay, I got a couple more, Ash, real quickly, and then Go ahead. you will you and Kate. This is true. Ash always gets final word with our guests. Always the first. Um, okay. What is the greatest number of sneakers you've owned at one time? Oh, it's. I mean, I would say for the last couple of years, I've owned a steady number of sneakers because I try to get rid of one every time I, I get a new pair. I would say probably right now I own like 55 pairs. That seems like too many, doesn't it? Well, well Chris, I have a lot of work to do. You do. Yeah. But Ash yeah. is improving her sneaker game. Yeah, Chris uh, started it. Lastly, for me, tell me if this is true. It was in the Colorado bio, so I hope your school got it right. You interned for Conan O'Brien one summer. Did you ever get a joke or something on the air? Oh, good question, Chris. Um, I didn't get a joke on the air, but okay. they once did a sketch of uh, like a child kids' drawings. I don't know. I don't know what the premise of the sketch was, but the point was that like they needed six to eight kids like drawings with crayons. And I drew one of those pictures Okay. and it made it on air, but cool. I wouldn't say that they were empowering their interns to write jokes or really advocating mm -hmm. for their interns to speak out loud very frequently. Yeah. It was, it was mostly running to the copier because <laughs> it was, it was 2003 or whatever. I mean, we it, things they didn't have iPads. Wow, this is crazy that I'm talking like this. But yeah, they, I had to print out all the scripts. That was my job. I was the the script printer outer, which feels like a heavy burden. You know, I mean, those that stuff's important. Got to print right. that right. Yeah. Everybody's been an intern somewhere. I used exactly. to run tapes for it. I mean, everybody's done it. Log tapes, yep. log melts, which no one even knows what that means anymore. <laughs> Don't know what it means anymore <laughs> no. either. Yeah. Uh, were your drawings as as good as Sophia's? <laughs> Um, I think, I, thanks Ash. I, I think we all know the answer to that. Although I had the benefit of, I was supposed to be drawing like a small child. Well, so, so, the stakes so you had high. Yeah, you were like, exactly. I was trying not yes. to be good. Right. Yes. Trying that was the mission. Right. Yeah. Well, Ash, we, March, we, March we, do this, we do this a lot. We said 10 minutes. It's been 20. Uh, yeah, we take, yeah, go time. get the book. <laughs> it's, it's incredible. Kate, thank you for all the time. Thank you for doing the show in the first place. We appreciate it. Yeah, thanks to you both. Thanks for, for actually doing some research. This is so exciting. <laughs> Appreciate it. <laughs> Teams. Athletes. Organizations. We're transforming the custom apparel industry through product and purpose. Claim your crown. And now back to Honorado and Company, sponsored by Alpen House. That was fun. That was a lot of fun with Kate Fagan. Uh, played hoops at Niskiuna. Um, by the way, just saw a novice spot too. Bethlehem boys beat Niskiuna on Wednesday night in the yep. first round of sectionals. Um, and that is a win for the Bar Bernardo family. That is a win for the Bernardo family. Uh, yeah, Kate was awesome. I, I really enjoyed the conversation. Um, and I know, listen, I, I'm not going to ever say I don't love a book or I don't like a book, but I really love that book. It's, it's really, really cool. And like I said, I haven't gotten through all of it, but it's very unique. And if you're into hoops in any way, shape or form, even if you're not into women's hoops, you can still you can just learn so much. It's really yeah. cool. Yeah. And now, dirty, difficult, and done. Sponsored by Performance Industrial. 
With our guy Bill Miller and his great team up in South Glens Falls Performance Industrial, the sponsor here of Dirty Difficult Done. Ash? Sam, I'm going to bring your comment back because Ooh. I did not steal. I promise I had this done before you put this comment in. But early in the show, this is Sam's comment. Essentially, he stole my Dirty Difficult Done. Good work, Sam. That's okay. I, I love it. I like that we're on the same page. Uh, my dirty difficult done is that this year's Q's team, much like the past couple years, has been very difficult to watch, but also, in my opinion, it is time for Bayheim to be done. We talked about his personality and clashing with student reporters and all that, but the fact of the matter is, is that this team is not fun to watch, generally. They have some very talented players, but have not put it together for the entire season. And this is in a year when the ACC is entirely up for grabs, entirely up for grabs. And yet they're meddling middle of the road, nine and eight in the ACC, 16 and 12, I believe overall, they're a 500 team. They play like a 500 team. They watch like a 500 team. Like it's nothing yeah. about it is what Syracuse basketball should be. So I know Bayheim says everyone wants him there. Everyone wants him to be there. Well, you know what? When you miss out on the NCAA tournament this year and you fail to do anything in the NIT, which no one's going to watch anyway, I'm not so sure that everyone is going to want you still there. Who, who is everyone? Never, in, never, in the, never in the course of history has every has everyone wanted, wanted anyone anything. to be anywhere. Okay, not no, even a majority of people. Right, people. Not everybody wanted Jordan around. Not everybody has wanted LeBron around. Right. Nobody, not everybody wanted Jesus Christ around. Okay. Right. And listen, like, relax. like, and not everyone can agree on who the greatest player in the NBA is. LeBron, is it Michael Jordan? You, you know what I mean? You're never going to get, it's, it's stupid. Uh, Eric B enemy was done dirty. This is a double. You did. Done you had dirty. a double too, didn't you? That's, uh, that's good. This is a double. Eric B enemy done dirty by the, this guy. Had to go to the commanders Ugh. to even get the opportunity to call plays on offense. I'm not saying Andy Reid should have given up his play call. Right. They've been very successful as a team. Mm -hmm. But for no other team in the last four years to find the value in what Eric Bieniemy has been able to do in Kansas City to say, we need that guy to, one, either be our head coach, preferably, or two, how do we get him away from the Chiefs and Andy Reid to be our play caller on offense? We're going to make him offensive coordinator with the ability to call plays, which he's not currently doing in Kansas City. And let's make him associate head coach. Let's do that. Yeah. A team that had either a head coach that was in a fragile position or nearing the end of his career. You're telling me there wasn't somebody in the last four years that could have benefited from Eric Bieniemy being on the staff. It's just, and I've heard since he took the Washington job, oh, he doesn't interview well. I don't care how you interview. Yeah. How do you coach? It's very how obvious you he can coach. coach what What does Patrick Mahomes say about Eric Bieniemy as a person and as a coach? I don't care how you interview. Is he getting ringing endorsements from the players he has coached? And look at the X's and O's and how has that team performed? I, I don't care. And to be honest okay. with you, in the very few times that I've heard him speak for the media, which is generally Super Bowl opportunities when they actually talk to coordinators, he's been great. And yeah. I thought, this guy's great. And he's much more honest than most. Most head coaches are like, coach speak, coach speak. I thought right. he was fantastic. So I feel bad for him because now he's going to a team that's not very good with a team that has no idea who their quarterback is. So good luck to him, but I hope for the best. I know, no doubt. All right, we're back right after this on Honorado and Company. Uh, when we come back, our conversation with Magnum P.I., Jay Hernandez. Get a head start on summer fun with Elfenhouse RV. It's our preseason sales event going on now. Come in today to shop America's top brands like Forest River, Coachman, Keystone, and Grand Design. Right now, get this Coachman Catalina for only $3.06 a month or this Primetime Tracer for only $2.52 a month. Our knowledgeable outfitters are here to help you find the perfect RV for your family. Shop online anytime at alpenhouserv.com. Buy with confidence at Alpenhouse RV, your total camping outfitter. 
And now back to Honorado and Company, sponsored by Alpen House. It's Chris Honorado. It's Ashley Miller. And how cool is this? Magnum PI with us on Honorado and Company. It's Jay Hernandez. Jay, man, thanks for taking the time to, to do this interview with us. How are you? I'm great, man. Thanks for having me. You know, I'll be honest, most of the times we do interviews like this, the interview subject cannot see us. And I would have used a line to say something like, hey, I know you can't see us, but take my wife's word for us. We both suffer from the same affliction, overly handsome. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I And, and I agree. I totally agree. <laughs> thanks for playing along. I agree. Also. I appreciate that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, listen, thanks to the suckers from CBS for uh, giving Magnum PI to NBC. We, we will, appreciate yeah. it. We will take yeah. it. Yeah. Uh, how Bad excited news. are you for kind of this yeah. relaunch? Uh, it's been amazing. NBC has, uh, our new home has been just so supportive. I mean, I'm honestly, I'm, I'm genuinely shocked. Uh, you don't get that kind of love in season five of a television show. I don't mm -hmm. care what show it is, what network it is. It's just, uh, it's been, it's been pretty surprising, super special. And it's been awesome for us, the cast, the crew, and ultimately for the audience, you know, they get another season of Magnum. I was going to say, Jay, you probably have an established fan base at this point that will now find you at a new home, but maybe you reach a new audience. Maybe you reach some new people here on News Channel 13 and NBC. Mm -hmm. What can they expect? Why should they watch this show? What will they love about it? The thing that, I mean, there's a lot of, there's a lot to love about Magnum. It's, we shoot in Hawaii. There's a ton of action. There's this great sense of Ohana, which is like a, a you know, a, a sense of family, essentially. And um, over the course of four seasons, now five, we've, we've really built a, a shorthand with the audience. Uh, you know, uh, Magnum is a guy who, who's, who's led by his heart. He just wants to do good and do good things for people in the world and, uh, and solve crimes. And, and, you know, at the same time, be a pretty, uh, be a badass, you know? Yeah. <laughs> so so it's, been, it's been a lot of fun. And I think, uh, you know, it's, I, when the show got canceled, I heard so many stories, people, um, uh, tagging me on social media, talking about how it would be, you know, family night. Yeah. Grandma, the kids, um, it's something that like multi-generations could, could enjoy together and no one's uncomfortable, but everyone's having a good time. So, so yeah, you, that's what you can expect from Magnum. It's a, it's a fun show and a, and, and a bit of escapism ultimately. Right. And Sunday night's a good family night, nine o'clock on news channel 13. Uh, Jay, you've got such a long list of film credits. Um, mm -hmm. Do you enjoy playing the same character over and over again the way you do with Magnum? What's what's the benefit to that? And and does it? I mean, I can't imagine this role ever bores you. No, no. I mean, it's, it's never a boring day on set. That's for sure. Uh, it's it's they're totally different things. It's like doing theater, stage. It's uh, you know, a film is is you got maybe two to six months at most generally. Uh, of working on the project and then you move on, you go to the premiere and then it's, it's over. Uh, Magnum is this, is this character that, that lives and evolves and mm -hmm. uh, you know, we're in people's home every week. So they do really get a sense of family. They feel like we're part of the, part of their family and, and, and we, we have dinner with them essentially, you know, people <laughs> just, uh, I don't know. It's, it's a different type of thing when, uh, when you're in people's homes that often and uh, we, they're, they're committed to, to, to the show. It's been great. Jay, season five, we've read it may be sexier, a little more heat. Um, mm. Is this kind of a change from the norm? And what will people find with this new season here on NBC? Well, you know, I feel like they did push the, the, the sort of boundaries a little bit further, <laughs> uh, which we're having fun with. And um, it's great because, you know, Magnum and Higgins, uh, they, they've worked together for so long. But we've been teasing this potential relationship for now, I think, like three, three or so seasons. And ultimately, this season, we make it happen. We're officially a couple. And uh, it, it's just a lot of fun playing that and, and sort of, you know, living in that new dynamic. You look like a dude who belongs in Hawaiian T-shirts or or resort gear of some sort. Um, yeah, I know yeah. it's, you know, you, look, you grew up on the West Coast. You've got that, that style and flair. I love it. Um, the Tiger's hat is still part of Magnum PI. The mustache is not. I think that's a good call. Um, mm -hmm. Did you have to embrace the wearing a hat at times with good hair like that? <laughs> no, I don't mind the hat. It was... Uh... 
it was funny. I never, I don't know if I had a single Aloha shirt prior to, prior to doing Magnum, but now my closet in Hawaii <laughs> is just, that's all it is. You know, it's full of, uh, full of uh, Aloha shirts and flip-flops. It's funny when I was coming to New York for press, I was like, I don't have a single thing to wear. Season five now, so some people are used to this, but it's a change from the original Magnum in terms of a female character. Um, how much fun has that added to the process and just changing the dynamic of the original and making it its own while also staying true in some ways to the original Magnum? Well, the original, you know, sort of dynamic between Higgins and, and uh, Magnum was very contentious. You know, they were kind of always like butting heads and we've kept that, right? Mm -hmm. So, so, uh, that's one of the, the the elements that I think a lot of people respond to is their dynamic together and, and how they sort of needle each other constantly. Uh, but at the end of the day, it's all love. And 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 it's the, the proof is that they're now dating, you know, so so that's that's a new spin, a little a new twist that, that we've added to the show. And uh, I think it's a lot of fun. You're no stranger to obviously playing a love interest in a movie or having a love interest in a movie. Why is the dynamic with you and Perdita so perfect? I think I think it's perfect because um, in real life we very much have that same quality. We're, we're you know we're we're always challenging each other intellectually. We always think the other one is wrong, and we know that we're right. So all we have to do is really uh, you know shift that over from our personal relationship to to the uh, professional one, and it really works for the characters, and uh, and it's kind of effortless. We're happy to have you guys on News Channel 13 and NBC, and uh, we'll be tuned in. Yeah, Jay, thank you, man. Thank you so much for the love. Appreciate it. Teams. Athletes. Organizations. We're transforming the custom apparel industry through product and purpose. Claim your crown. And now back to Honorado and Company, sponsored by Alpen House. Ash, last week um, I had the opportunity to go to the Firewolves game, which was very cool. The box out cancer night. You came home and I was watching reruns of Magnum PI. You were? Yeah. So um, I'm into it too. Uh, it's a fun show. My, my best friend from growing up in New Jersey, his mom texted me, hey, I see you had Magnum P.I. on the show. <laughs> That's pretty cool. Jay Hernandez. Well, yeah. She must watch. Yeah, Magnum P.I. Yeah. 2.0. Uh, awesome. And she did watch. All right, speaking of the Firewolves, this is a segment we do each and every week here on Honorado and Company, and it is called Follow the Pack sponsored by the Albany Firewolves and back for a repeat performance on the show. Yeah. Our guy, Brent Mitchell. Let's bring him into the conversation here. Brent, thanks for hanging out, waiting for us. How are you? Dude? Good. How are you guys? We're good, man. Good. Um, all right. I'll just hit you. I'll hit you off the top here. <laughs> How do you handle a team like Georgia, which we kind of go ad nauseum here, obviously has that, that great former U Albany star, Lyle Thompson. Well, they're in a similar spot to us. They're, uh, you know, they're struggling to put together wins, but they're obviously a good team. And yeah. all of their losses are close. They're all like close. So they're losing by one or two goals a game. So they're going to be hungry and we just got to be hungrier. Brent, have you played against Lyle before in your young career? And if not, I assume you've seen him on tape. What makes him so unique? Uh, well, yeah, I did play him. I played him in our training camp, actually. And that was, I was pretty starstruck, to be completely honest with you. I think this time around, I'm kind of, I know what's coming. So yeah. I'll be more prepared. But you got to play him like you play everybody else and just limit his opportunities and chances. Because if you make a mistake, he's going to capitalize. There's, yeah, there's no way around it. Where is this Albany Firewolves defense now? It's the offense that's gotten most of the attention, which hasn't always been good attention uh in the last few games but where is this defense right now honestly i think in our last game against vegas we looked pretty good we just yeah. had a few mess ups and that cost us the game but we were playing as a team and kind of moving as a well-oiled machine so i i like the feel of it felt like we were winning the whole game but we ended up losing so 
moving forward, I uh, I think we're going to do good things. Yeah, Ash, what did they give up? One or two goals in the second quarter against Vegas? It was nothing. Yeah. Yeah, not much. Yeah. And then, and then just the offense struggled in that final quarter and got outscored for nothing, which was, was kind of the difference there. But Brent at two and six, I, I know we're only halfway through the season, but we talked to, to coach Clark about this and that you start already early on, you start to look at records and what it means for the playoffs because you know, you can't get yourself in too big of a hole. You've got a swarm team who somehow has not won a game yet this season at zero and seven but with a guy like Lyle Thompson, and we talk about this all the time with you guys, you guys have talented players. Georgia has talented players. How much do you focus on beating this team, especially because there's someone behind you in the standings, someone that you, you know, when you look at records, you should beat this team. Yeah, I think, I think there's extra weight on this game and the game next week. Again, mm-hmm. we got to win both of them. We got to stack up some wins here. So uh, obviously a lot of the focus is on Lyle, but they have other weapons too. And I think, I think a lot of teams will focus just on Lyle and that's why other guys are scoring more. So you got to play them as a team because they'll work as a team. Ashley, I'll give you final word with our guy here. Uh, no, we're back March 4th for people who yeah. are looking to buy tickets. You know, this is a team that we got to fill the arena to get the energy up. You guys have struggled at home, which that is the opposite of what generally happens um, in a professional sports league. Normally you're better at home because you have the fans <laughs> That hasn't been the case that this year. So I, I know you guys are going to give them a reason to cheer. And obviously they can come see Lyle too, who they know very well. Absolutely. But uh, Indigenous Night at, at MVP Arena. So another cool event that that the MVP Arena and the Firewolves put on a lot of those theme nights, which Chris, you said you were part of the Box Out Cancer Night. Um, yep. And we've got another one coming. But yeah, big two games, Brent. So good luck. And uh, hopefully you get those two wins and get you to four and you guys start to climb the rankings there. Exactly. I love it. Yeah, it's one of those weird hockey or NBA things where, like, you play the back-to-back, yeah. same opponent, but yeah, with a different home. city. So, yep. yeah, pretty cool. All right, Brent. Dude, thanks for doing this again, man. Uh, good luck this weekend. We'll see you on the 4th. Have a good one, guys. See you, All right, Brent. That is uh, Albany Firewolves defender Brent Mitchell with us here on Honorado and Company. Um, March 4th, again, as Ash says, the next home game. Yep. We'll get those tickets. So, AlbanyFirewolves.com. Easy way to do that. We'll take one more time out here. What's that? Good time at the game. Oh yeah. I mean, look, it's the indoor lacrosse game is like going to an NBA game. Yeah. There is music constantly playing. Um, Good, good public address announcer. Mike Falvo kills it. Um, The the action is nonstop. Mm -hmm. It would be like hockey if hockey played music throughout. It doesn't. The NBA does. Yep. It is a constant party. It's it's worth going to a game if you haven't done it. And if you have, it's worth going back for sure. All right. Back right after this on Honorado and Company. We've got a little baseball to get into here. Aww. Aaron Judge spoke with the media his first time doing that as captain of the Yankees. Whether you're into lounging, cruising, or just relaxing, summer fun starts with Alpen House. Enjoy a smooth ride that'll change the way you boat forever on a Barletta pontoon powered by Mercury Outboard. Nobody makes a more reliable, powerful lineup of outboard motors than Mercury to continue propelling your adventures. Now's the perfect time to buy a new Barletta pontoon with the legendary performance of a Mercury outboard. Alpenhouse, Route 30, Amsterdam, and alpenhouseboats.com. And now, back to Honorado and Company. Sponsored by Alpenhouse. Okay, Ash, uh, spring training is in full swing now. I love hearing as, that. Uh, you know, pitchers and catchers Baseball. have been in for about 10 days or so at this point. But all players are now in. Full team workouts have taken place. If you're watching us on Saturday night on my four, the Yankees have already played a spring training game. Got some games, yeah. They play the Phillies at uh, 1 o'clock on Saturday um, I loved Aaron Judge's reaction to I think it was our guy, Bruce Beck, who asked him, mm. how do you follow up 62? Can you do that? He, Bruce kind of dovetailed into, you know, you're the, you're the captain now. Do you, do you lead any differently? Can you possibly do 62 again? You never know. You know who says that? The Rock Man. The Rock Man. Aaron Judge taking a line out of the Rock Man's playbook. You never yeah. know. 
He owes Frank some royalties. J-Man yeah. says 63. <laughs> well, okay. Yeah. Uh, I was wrong because when Judge hit 51 or 2, his yep. his rookie seat, I thought he'll probably never hit 50 again. You generally uh, think that about people. You know how difficult that is. You say, I generally think that? You think they've peaked early and they're like, no, we'll do it again. No, I just you think when you, peak, when you peak yeah. that high, I know uh, it's it was unre- the expectations then were unrealistic. They're like, oh, this guy's going to be an all time great. Now he's a very, very good player. He now owns the record for most home runs by an American. He'll be an all time great Yankee, though. I mean, as long I with that contract, he'll be an all time great Yankee. Yeah, I get it. Not without one of those, he won't be. I get it. They will. That will be the yeah, but. If he hits the most home runs in franchise history or something crazy like that, he'll be an all-time great Yankee. What will they say? Aaron Judge. Listen, you're putting a, you're assuming he's not going to win one. The guy's got tons of time that. to do it. I'm just saying, in order to be considered an all-time great Yankee, he has to get a ring. I don't think that's true, but I get it. Okay. All right. Um the idea of an encore for judge being better than what he did last year and and he may play a little bit of left field now too we're hearing that it it may benefit the yankees defensively uh to put stanton in right which is his natural position going back to the marlins bader and center judge and left judge says hey if this is what's good for the team then i'll do it i don't good on him good on him i know but i don't like it from a from a Yankees perspective. Okay. I don't like it. Okay. Um, hey, stop me if you've heard this before. Jacob deGrom has huh. tightness. Um, I mean, day <laughs> the, one. The Rangers are quickly going to learn what this is all about. Day one. Yeah. DeGrom had to go see the trainer in tightness. These are all before the season even gets started. Manny Machado says he's probably going to opt out. Well, not if he has a bad year, he won't. Although maybe even after a bad year, someone will pay him more than the $30 million he's going to make. So is it now or never for San Diego? I don't know. They may just have to kind of open the checkbook again for Manny Machado if he does opt out. And Mike Trout is already in recruitment mode to keep Shohei Otani. He has said, I'm going to do everything I can possibly do to keep this guy here. At the end of the day, I don't think it'll be enough. I think we are going to see Shohei Otani in his final season with Hmm. the Anaheim Angels. Yeah, I wonder if he is nostalgic at all to the fact that the Angels are his first team. Like, I don't know. I I wonder how much he will put into that and put into being friendly with and enjoying playing with his teammates versus winning. I don't know. I guess you'd have to ask him. But uh they're not going to win in Anaheim anytime soon. So you could recruit all you want, but if you want to win, you don't stay in Anaheim. And the Dodgers have positioned themselves perfectly to not overspend in the year or two ahead of Otani being available. They will throw everything at him. He won't have to change cities. He'll stay on the West Coast, which is probably preferred. Why not? Yeah. That 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 makes too much sense. Mm-hmm. It makes absolutely too much sense. So baseball is is almost back. <laughs> it's true. I know. It's true. Yeah. <laughs> and look, I mean, I you know, I love Mike Trout, but it was a bad no, decision for him to stay too. We yeah. we've we've known that. But, right, but that's everybody. the thing. So say he finishes out his career, he's not gonna be an all time great if he doesn't win a ring. He's not gonna win a ring. Mike Trout. Oh, he'll be an all-time great. And then we'll say Buddy never won. 